Good evening, and thank you for attending this evening's meeting. We have a quorum, and so we will start off with the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Elena, our student board member, if you will start us off by doing the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. All right, I would like to see a motion to either adopt or amend the agenda as listed. Motion to adopt to adopt agenda as listed. Do I have a second? All right. We have a first and a second. All in approval of adoption of the agenda, please raise your hand. It is unanimous. Thank you so much. And now we will move on to the director's report. All right, good evening, and thank you, Chair Arad and board members. Um, so good to see you this evening. Thank you. All right, so last month, um, the National Public Education Foundation in Nashville's agenda honored this year's Blue Ribbon Teachers. Um, 50 outstanding educators from schools across the district. This was a very inspiring event for me as I got to be with and celebrate all of these amazing teachers. They all give so much of themselves every day and every year to make sure every student is known. They make sure that they're known, that they're cared for, supported, and on a path to success. So again, we'd like to give a hearty congratulations to all of this year's Blue Ribbon teachers. Let's give them a round of applause. Now, as we move to the next slide, I, just as a reminder, on Saturday, November 19th, I hope you all will join us for the Celebration of Schools Parade and Fair hosted by the Tennessee Titans at Nissan Stadium. We've had a lot of successes to celebrate in the past few months due to the hard work and accomplishments of our students, our families, our teachers, and our staff. And this celebration will offer an opportunity to showcase the many talents and unique traits our schools and their teams have to offer the city. So we encourage all of our MNPS families and perspectives of families to come and join us in the celebration and stay to interact with district and school leadership teams who will provide important information on how to be engaged in your student's success. The parade will feature students and faculty from district-run schools throughout MPS and will loop around Nissan Stadium, led by our high school marching bands and culminating in performances on the east side of the stadium. In addition to the parade, there will be family, friends, games and entertainment, food and refreshments, and school supplies for students provided by pencil. <laughs> The parade will be followed by a fair, giving opportunities for students to, and families to engage with student representatives to learn more about schools and um, all of our upcoming opportunities. Um, and we'll um, highlight the launch of Family University, a program to provide families with knowledge, tools, and resources to be engaged in their students' educational experience and how to advocate for their needs. So again, I hope you all can join us Saturday November 19th down at Nissan Stadium. Now for tonight's um, update, I want to give just a, a quick preview as we invite um, our leaders up to the podium who will share in this presentation. It's an exciting and inspiring um, initiative um, that we're kicking off here um, in MEPS. Um, it's all about eliminating disparities in education. It requires us to think beyond just, just catching kids up when they get to us. The truth is, we need to get them on a level playing field to start with. This is why I'm so excited about our Birth to Three initiative, Grow Together with MNPS. We know just how quickly children's brains are developing between birth and age three. And we know that they're ready, they're ready during those years to absorb new information and build healthy relationships with caregivers. So we're working on a program to support parents, guardians, and caregivers with information and resources to help them ensure that their child has a strong, healthy foundation for future growth. 
This extends our focus on making every student known to students who aren't even our students yet, but we know it's worth the effort, and we know it's what we need to be doing to contribute even more to the future success of our community. So again, at this time, I would like to welcome up David Williams, who is our Executive Officer of Teaching and Learning, and Phyllis Phillips, who leads our pre-K department. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, uh, Chair Oa, Dr. Battle, members of the board. I'm pleased and excited to be sharing uh, some information with you regarding our Growth Together uh, initiative that we're working on, and I'll be joined by uh, my colleague here, Phyllis Phillips, uh, Director of the Early Learning Department. When we think about our signature initiatives uh, and focused outcomes with early learning, we re-envision re um, central office as a support hub, not just for our schools, but for our families and communities as well. We believe that providing supports and resources in a child's earliest years is one of the best ways we can preemptively and proactively identify and eliminate inequities. Certainly, these efforts aim to prepare students for learning <coughs> numeracy and literacy in their school age years, while helping families navigate the many transitions within the child's earliest years, including those within the school system. A bit of background on why efforts in this space are so critical, as Dr. Battle uh, mentioned. We all know the importance of reading on grade level by uh, grade three to open doors for future learning, economic opportunity, and overall well-being. The foundation for this milestone begins very early in a child's life. Research shows significant disparities in language and vocabulary development between children living in poverty and those in more affluent homes. Students who participate in high-quality pre-K programs, such as ours, have a better chance of re reaching this milestone. But when students enter kindergarten and there are gaps in vocabulary and skills, this stubborn gap is extremely difficult to close. Phyllis and I are going to sketch out 10 core strategies for you this evening. Uh, there are five within the birth to three space and we'll spend more time there. We also have five uh, related to pre-K expansion that I will talk about after Phyllis. Phyllis. Thank you, David. Uh, good evening, Dr. Battle and board members. Grow Together with MMPS consists of two initiatives focused on providing additional services to students, families, as well as employees. On the screen, you see the Grow Together logo created in collaboration with the Communications Department. And if you look closely in the middle of the O in Grow, you can see infant feet to indicate the focus on infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. Grow Together signifies an educational journey partnering alongside MMPS that can start as early as a child's birth. Birth to Three will support families and their children during those critical first <coughs> years of a child's development. The Birth to Three initiative will help to increase a child's vocabulary, oral language skills, and phonological awareness skills, which are all foundational literacy skills needed to become proficient readers by third grade. It will also help increase numeracy and social and emotional learning skills. Do I yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Grow Together Birth to Three consists of five core strategies. Over the next few slides, I will present information on each strategy covering details of the implementation of a text messaging service, play dates and child development workshops, home and televisits, care bags, and a website. And all of these are features of the Birth to Three initiative. We know that some people may be asking why Birth to Three, and our answer would be why not. Knowing the expectations for reading proficiency by third grade, this initiative would give us the prime opportunity to positively impact a child's reading and schooling success. At this age, children are growing and developing so rapidly. Providing services as early as birth to three would help to give families and their child a great start to their schooling career. This initiative would give MMPS an opportunity to make connections with families early on to provide information, tips, strategies, and activities that would set the foundation for success. I'm going to begin with the text messaging service. 
The text messaging service implemented specifically for Grow Together with MMPS would be geared to families of children birth to three years of age. Families who opt to participate would receive monthly text messages providing information, reminders, and opportunities to register for play dates and workshops focused on child development. Grow Together with MMPS Birth to Three would provide the opportunity for families to, to participate in play dates and child development workshops. This would give families the chance to attend right along with their child and other families within the community sessions focused on learning developmentally appropriate games, chants, songs, and activities that they can do with their child to help strengthen literacy and numeracy skills. As we know, there are other agencies currently providing some of the same services. We would like to partner with these community agencies to collaborate with us on providing play dates as well as child development workshops. Another unique feature of the Grow Together initiative is the home visits and televisits offered to families who may want a more intimate one-on-one -on -one session to discuss their child's needs ask questions or get specific information. We would want to coordinate with the Family Engagement Department as well as hospital staff and Metro Health for resources and information to share with families while on these visits. We want to provide a Grow Together Birth to Three website for families. <coughs> This website would provide families with information to support their child's development from birth to three years of age. On the screen, you see the features of the website. The content information would be, would be provided by MMPS, community partners, along with state and federal agencies. We would use the MMPS website so that the pages could be housed on the early learning pre-K site. MMPS would provide care bags, and we would like to distribute care bags that would consist of items useful to families and include the Grow Together logo on specific items. On the screen, you see samples of the items that could be included in the bag from onesies to board books and even electrical outlet sockets. We would pilot the care bag program by first providing about 800 bags to Davidson County families in a specific area of town with the idea to expand the program throughout the county to all families of newborns or who register to receive a bag. This strategy will require partnership with community agencies to help fund and distribute the care bags to families. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, pre-K classrooms and increasing uh, our uh, efforts there. Uh, so one thing to point out is that we have four early learning centers which offer exclusively pre-K classrooms, and we have 70 elementary schools. Um, but we also know that of the 70 elementary schools, 14 of them have only one pre-K classroom and 10 do not have any pre-K classrooms. So we're looking, uh, working with our facilities department to identify areas of immediate expansion so that we can more immediately serve and meet the demands uh, for our families to offer more classrooms. <clears throat> We'd also like to uh, examine and consider an early learning hub that would serve as a multi-function, multi-purpose facility. First, there would be space for teacher professional development as well as workshops for parents, including the play dates and uh, parenting uh, workshops, child development workshops that Phyllis mentioned earlier. And with model classrooms, the idea is that teachers can attend professional development and then immediately be able to go see those strategies implemented in action. We'd also want to include child care for MPS employees. We think that would be um, a great new feature. And of course, we want to include services for our exceptional learners as well. We also want to support our families as they transition from MMPS pre-K classrooms into MMPS kindergarten. Between enrollment, possibly moving to a different school from pre-K to K, immunizations and shot records and more, we want to provide a more seamless transition for families from pre-K to K. 
There are some very simple ways we have already begun to identify, starting with supporting families with the online registration process. We want all of our elementary schools to have a team equipped to support families and navigate this enrollment process. The Support Hub will also host its annual Countdown to Kindergarten Fair, but we simply want to do this before the school process, uh, school option window opens. We also want to support our schools in developing a kindergarten going atmosphere similar to how we think about college and career readiness in our secondary schools. We want our students and families ready for kindergarten academically, socially, emotionally, and not have any bar barriers or process get in the way of this. Next, we want to include more students with IEPs in the general education classroom with their, their peers. Currently, we have three types of classroom in our pre-K programs. We have a general education uh, classroom, which uh, allows up to two students with disabilities to participate in that classroom. We have blended classrooms, which are roughly 50-50 students, uh, general education students and students with disabilities. And then we have self-contained classrooms to meet the needs of students with our most intensive needs. When we think about K-12 classrooms, however, we generally focus on having all students participate in their least restrictive environment. So why not do the same thing with pre-K? So we want to move away from having these three types of classrooms and towards all students participating in their least restrictive environment while continuing to offer the full continuum of services. And finally, uh, the last strategy here for our pre-K expansion is we want to explore having half day, offering half day programs for our preschool or three-year-old students. Full-time teachers would essentially teach two cohorts of students, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, which effectively doubles the number of students that we would be able to serve. So I did have a next step slide. It's not on here, but I will go ahead and uh, recap some of our next steps. So while we are deep in the investigation and exploration phase with some of the core strategies that we've outlined for you, uh, we do have some immediate next steps. First, we want to complete the website that Phyllis uh, mentioned earlier. We'll have it live very soon. Our goal is to have that by the end of the semester. Again, it's, it's really important that we work with our community partners to develop the content so we're consistent uh, from agency to agency and organization to organization uh, with the information that families are provided. We want to continue to engage our community partners, some of whom are already working in these spaces, and we just want to lock arms and join alongside them in these efforts. We need their talent, their time, and their resources to be sure. We are working with our facilities team to identify areas of immediate expansion for pre-K classrooms, including uh, the early learning hub that was mentioned earlier. And we are building out supports for our elementary schools as they build the kindergarten going atmosphere in their schools and support families through the pre-K to K transition, specifically MMPS pre-K to MMPSK. So with that, Dr. Battle, I'll turn it back over to you. All right, thank you so much, um, Dr. Williams and um, uh, Phil Phillips for that um, presentation. And at this time, um, Chair, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions? All right, we'll start with Ms. Tyler. Yeah, so um, I want to start off by saying that I'm a huge proponent of um, early childhood development and supporting our all of our children that are part of our community, no matter what their age are. Um, with that being said, we have very limited resources. And so my main question is, um, how much is this expected to cost? Um, and where will these funds come from? And what's going to happen to our existing services because of these additional things? Thank you so much. And of course, that's been a part of the planning process and envisioning um, a, a kind of an initiative, a strategy to make sure that we're serving and preparing all of our students. And so um, I will kick it over to the team to respond to um, our vision around really leveraging the, the, the talents, the time, and the resources um, that are already existent. Um, in our community and how we can expand on, on those with a comprehensive um, support for all students. So, David. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Battle, and thank you for the question. Uh, that's always a concern and a consideration. Um, but I would say when you think about things like the website, that's free. Um, when you think about how we can ensure a seamless transition from pre-K to K, that's incumbent on us to streamline our processes and make sure we communicate those in a transparent way, that's free. Um, so those are things that we, we've already begun doing um, that are at no cost to us. Um, when we think about some of the other birth to three initiatives like the care bags that Phyllis mentioned, uh, we want to really engage our partners and work with them. Uh, we've had a, a few uh, small conversations with a few and, and everyone is excited about this and they're, they're wanting to jump in and say, when can we help? 
how can we help? How much do you need? And when can we get started? Um, and so we're going to rely on a lot of our partners uh, to jump in and, again, offer their time, talent, and resources. Um, for some of the uh, support hub uh, or the uh, early learning hub that I talked about, we want to look at utilizing existing building spaces without having to go out and start from scratch and, and uh, create an existing space. Um, so we're working through some of those details. I don't have a, a fine number right now. Uh, but, again, I just would say that we're trying to be as efficient as possible, working with our partners and then looking out what some extra cost may be. Okay. Um, and I understand, like, I mean, we still have to pay somebody to create the website and, and to maintain it, so it's not really free. Well, there's um, no there's no additional cost, and so what we're looking at is what can we be doing now in this space, and then in a phased approach, what can the future um, also present as far as implementing and executing on some of these strategies. So there is, you do see, um, and as the team continues to build build this out, you will see phased um, approaches to um, how and when some of these can be implemented. The website is one of the first ones because we are do have a current website. Uh, we have such great expertise um, on our team. We have such great partners who are leaning in um, for, for content. And so that's something that we can move on um, immediately, understanding that in our long-term strategy, there are so many more levers we can pull on, potentially much more um, investment um, in this space um, in the future. But we don't want to be paralyzed in the now, thinking about what we can't do, but really moving on what we can do to start supporting families much earlier. I don't have an issue with upping our support for pre-K students. I think that that's a vital service that we provide. Um, I would love to see us look for more grants, more federal funds from that as they become available. Um, I think with the idea right now, I think our pre-K kids have to provide their own transportation. Is that correct? That's correct. And um, would, so would that be a continuing requirement moving forward? But the hope is that we would offer more locations that would be more convenient to people. You're absolutely okay. spot on. Um, so the transportation requirement would be there. Uh, but in being um, much more strategic and um, how we build our classroom model out um, and um, shifting classrooms where we need to to meet demand, um, again, that's not necessarily an additional investment, but strategic, strategically making those movements um, happen is something that we're looking for forward to. And something else you've mentioned, there's, there are lots of um, um, partnership opportunities, there's other grant opportunities that when you have a comprehensive plan like Grow Together with MNPS, you're a um, front-runner candidate for to help support uh, movement now and in the future. Um, yeah, I just, I know we have been very lucky to have the kind of monetary support that we have not seen in many, many decades lately, um, both from the federal government and from our city council um, and mayor. And so I, I think that I don't want us to get used to that, unfortunately. <laughs> so I just want us to be mindful of not, not expanding so quickly that we accidentally hamstring ourselves. Um, because I think what our main focus what we are tasked with doing are our K through 12 kids. I think that there is a strong, strong argument for pre-K to be folded into that. I would love to see it continue. I think it's necessary. I think it's important. Um, and and so I just, I, there's just a little bit of hesitation around, you know, what kind of looks like a swag bag. You know, why would we spend money to you know, print onesies and, and things like that. When, I mean, I'm looking at what looks like a Dolly Parton Imagination Library book that she already gives away for free, but it's in our bag. I hope we're not paying for more of the same books. I mean, just Again, some things, it, it is yeah. about the partnership. So okay. a lot of this is around um, resources that are already available. You will see throughout this entire plan, Imagination Library, for instance. You will see um, other key partners. I'm not going to name one because there are so many of them that I don't want to leave anyone out. Um, and and that conversation. And so our initial um, conversations have been kind of gauging interest with our partners. And what we are hearing um, from our partners um, in this way is um, seeing a comprehensive um, uh, plan from MPS allows them to be v much more intentional and specific around where they plug in. Um, and so that's um, the excitement <laughs> we're hearing um, in the community um, around getting kind of a hub, if you will, um, of resources 
resources in one place for families. Of course, we have partners who've been doing extremely well um, in this space, but we want to make sure that that seamless, seamless transition um, truly is present for our families as they're moving from their early childhood pre-K experiences into the K-12 realm. So it's built, it, our intention is to build even stronger partnerships. There's going to continue to be a need for everything that's already um, mm -hmm. happening, but as you mentioned, um, in the care bag, seeing the, the book that is a representation of a book you will see in Imagination Library that we could leverage um, and have a part of um, those bags as well. Um, and then I noticed that your one of the thoughts was half-day preschool. Um, right now, I think our preschool ends just a little bit earlier than our regular school day. Have you um, reached out to families of existing pre-K kids to see what their thoughts are on switching from this size to its smaller size? Um, is there interest for that in our community? Yeah, so, um, and Phyllis, feel free to address this, and David um, as well. We have consistently um, over the years had hundreds of families who've remained on our wait list um, throughout the year in this space, and so we have some direct feedback um, from families of particularly four and three year olds um, around um, what their needs will be and if not our traditional um, program what they would love to see um, as a part of our offering so Phyllis I'll let you yeah this year we have over 600 families still on waiting lists and a majority of those on waiting lists are three-year-olds and um, we see half day for three-year-olds we want to continue our traditional four-year-old programs being mm -hmm. till two o'clock but we see the half-day programs giving those three-year-olds still on waiting lists an opportunity to come for half of the day in the morning, have a group in that morning time, and then a half day in the afternoon. We heard from families at the end of last year who did not get in asking, can we just even have a half-day program? Because that is a lot of... Uh, <laughs> desire for their child to just attend for a few hours and a lot of families still want to keep their child at home so having them here for a few hours was an option that we didn't offer last year but would love to offer in the future and would that be five days a week but just half days yes okay yes Okay, and then my only other thought was just kind of looking at that, include more pre-K students with IEPs. Um, I was under the impression that all of our pre-K was 50-50. Is that not correct? No, that's not our current model. We um, have a combination of uh, blended classrooms, correct me if I'm wrong, um, and our um, general um, ed um, classrooms. And so um, the, the great thinking and the expertise from this team um, has looked at what it would look like and how many uh, more seats and opportunities would be available to families if we, in fact, started with our earliest learners um, in that blended um, experience across um, the board and making sure our students have the least restrictive um, learning environment. Anything else, Tim, you want to add? No, I, I think just, just to add to that just a little bit, that is the expectation when they get into kindergarten, and so that that wouldn't necessitate a switch to the learning environment. I'm still with my uh, general ed peers in the least restrictive environment in pre-K, mm -hmm. kindergarten, and then going forward. So it's, it's not a switch for how we uh, provide, you know, supports and, and instruction to those students. All right. Okay. Um, well that, that's all I can think of right now. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Ms. Player, and then we'll have Elena. Oh, this is more of a comment than a question, but I guess a personal concern that I have, um, looking at the next really two to five years, that um, the partners we work with, particularly in the, corp in the nonprofit and corporate space, that we have to um, prepare and be digital of the population increase we're gonna have due to the abortion ban, that we're gonna have an increase of children into our community. And how do we work to advocate, going on to Ms. Tyler's part, of funds with those partners, of we're going to have to um, be prepared for that population increase, and how do we um, be a good resource to those communities um, and to those families? And I think that's something that um, kind of unintended consequences as, as we look for as we look for concerns and maximum capacity um, as our just general growth of Nashville, but then also um, of something that came, came from the state that um, I want us to be mindful of and really be strategic long term of how do we become together and advocate for more resources, whether it's in the corporate sector, nonprofit sector, government sector, that's going to take a whole community as we can, as we prepare for this in the future and the impact of that's going to have. 
Um, we don't know what those numbers, but as we look at demographic forecasting, um, this is something we keep in mind, just because this, these programs are going to feel it first before we feel it in kindergarten. And that's something I've been contemplating, contemplating uh, recently as we move on to our strategic planning. There's going to be a population increase of our students. And how do we welcome those, but then also how do we prepare for the resources needed to absorb the population increase? So that's just my common concern that I have that we can't um, forecast yet, but just be mindful of that and our community partners, more importantly, be mindful because there's a burden on them to make sure as they seek out funding resources that that's also attended to and the resources they need to make sure our children are healthy and whole um, as families um, grow. Thank you. Next, Elena. Hey. Okay. Um, so what would be the process to getting in contact with families? Would it be like a registration thing or is the district reaching out to families? Is it like, how, how does that work? Is it like an income-based thing? We would have a marketing plan uh, and I didn't get to show you parts of the website, but the website would include a sign up, a registration sign up that families could sign up if they want to participate in play dates, if they want to opt in on the text messaging service, or even want to attend one of the, um, not parenting workshops, child development uh, workshops. So it would be a registration process. Okay, and then, so help me understand. So the, Pre-K, the half day for pre-K three, would that be only for in the event that we have people on wait lists, or would all three roads be on a half day schedule? So this plan would be probably all three-year-olds unless there was space in the four-year-old program. We're going to continue the four-year-old program, but uh, right now this particular uh, strategy is for half day for all three-year-olds. <laughs> And currently, three-year-olds are doing all day right now? Yes. So currently, uh, and I'll kind of back up and say that this was the first year that the state allowed us to enroll three-year-olds in our four-year-old programs. And so this is kind of a new space for us, seeing as many three-year-olds applying. And so they are in our pre-K four classrooms with the understanding that they will be doing pre-K for two years. Okay. And so I was thinking, like, what would be, when I think about, like, a parent, like the average parent who's working nine to five, what is the benefit of doing, you know, like, a half-day program when I, I could see that kind of, I'm, I'm sure that definitely works for people that would, I 100% I, I believe that there are people who want a half-day program, but the, I feel like that could get inconvenient. So what is the benefit of doing MPS's half-day program versus just sending my child somewhere who will take them all day? I can res let me, I'll take that question. Um, so going back to the data that was presented earlier in the presentation, while the state has opened up an opportunity for three-year-olds to be a part of the four-year-old program, the majority of the time there's not a seat for a three-year-old. So the alternative is that the student is not in a program or they might be in um, a different, uh, various types of of daycare um, um, uh, programs. And so what our what we've heard from our families who have three-year-olds is that they could still benefit from and would prefer in lots of cases to have the structured three-year-old program, even if it's a half day. Um, not to mention that our current pre-K program is not an entire day um, like our elementary school. So they, they dismiss it at 2 o'clock um, as um, to uh, this school year as well. So it's not a full day um, as well. They're typically on an eight to two um, schedule. And so the alternative that we've heard from families is that if not the pre-K um, program, then we could at least benefit from the half day um, program um, within MNPS as well. That makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Ms. O'Hara Block and then Dr. Nama Beginney. Thank you. And, um, it's exciting to see um, some things that we can do to, to be focused on trying to make sure kids are really well prepared when they come to kindergarten. I know um, it's something uh, that all elementary schools struggle with. So I, a couple of questions about, um, in particular, on birth to three. 
Um, so the, the different initiatives that are in here, the text messaging, play dates, home visits, care bags, why, why did, why did, why are these the things? Like, um, are there, is there research that supports these particular things? What is it that we know that would tell us that these are sort of the right things to be doing? Um, first, and then second, how will we know if they're working? How will we measure it? All right, Phyllis. <clears throat> In having discussions with our community partners, uh, we listen to some of the services that they offer and uh, kind of took some uh, information from them and kind of uh, worked with departments within MMPS and came up with these strategies uh, and decided that play dates could be something that we could implement within the next few years. The text messaging services is something we could do that would help families. There's research and um, I think conducted in 2014 showing that the text messaging services does help families as, in terms of literacy skills. And then we uh, also looked at um, offering the having a one-stop shop of our website so that families could go and find resources uh, right at the um, right on our website that they may need that would help them so just talking with our community partners and uh, departments within MMPS now, the text messaging one is when I've, I've seen some of the research on text messaging programs um, and there's some decent uh, indication that like literacy scores are better among students who, um, and I think the state is even doing some of that now, if I'm right. But, and so how will we measure these things to know if, um, I think Ms. Tyler made a point earlier that, um, you know, even if things don't have a large cost, there's still sort of an opportunity cost between one thing and another. So how will we know that these things are working and that we should either continue to do them or, um, or do different things? You want to well, I would um, just first thing that comes to mind. I mean, there's there's obviously some surveys we could do with families to see how they're responding and are they making a difference in their homes. I think when we think about outcomes when students become school age, again, we start with our fast bridge screening as early as kindergarten. So kindergarten, first and second grade, we'll have our fast bridge data. Um, and when we look at state accountability tests by third grade, and that again is sort of that um, milestone that's so critical is that third grade reading. So that's ultimately kind of what we're aiming at here is that third grade reading because we know that's so critical for future success. Um, and so Ultimately, that would be how we measure, but I think we do have indications prior to that to make sure that this, this is making a difference for families who are participating. Um, great. I, yeah, I'm, I'm just one more question. Again, I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm focused on like the research and measurement and this type of thing, but um, so I have a sense from the both the Vanderbilt pre-K work that's been done and some other work in the pre-K space that um, that one of the things that's being recommended is uh, sort of a balance between play-based, um, developmentally appropriate curriculum and, and the ability of those types of things to uh, to sort of stick with kids longer, for, so the benefits of pre-K are sticking longer. You, you, there was a, a mention in the uh, presentation around the kindergarten going atmosphere throughout the year, and I think there's some sense that maybe uh, like a f more formal type of program for these kids doesn't, the structure maybe might not work as well. So just how are you all thinking about balancing sort of where the research seems to be going and, and knowing that we're trying to prep kids for kindergarten? Sorry, I know that was a long question. <laughs> I think we've got it. Can we take it in two parts? I'll talk about, because I mentioned the, the kindergarten readiness atmosphere. Phyllis is the early learning curriculum specialist, so I'll let, <laughs> I'll let her take that. Um, but the idea was simply um, we wanted we want our students who are participating in our programs to know they have somewhere to go next. And um, we want to make sure that they're thinking about kindergarten, they're thinking about kindergarten in their zone school, they're thinking about kindergarten in MPS zone school. So it's, it's really about an awareness and an opportunity expectation for us to make sure we're connecting with families in that space, that if they're participating in MMPS uh, pre-K programs, they just transition seamlessly into our MMPS kindergarten program. So when you were talking about the sort of college transition idea, you're, it's like the college banners that are on the wall and the right. college visits and that kind of thing. It's sort of a mentality of you can come to kindergarten here. We want you. Yes, Got it. That's okay. exactly right. That makes sense. Thank you. And. You mentioned the balance between play-based 
uh, curriculum. So I, I will say that we have a curriculum called Creative Curriculum that is play-based, project-based approach. <coughs> teachers guide children through intentional play where uh, teachers are, if you visit any of our classrooms, you'll see teachers having conversations with kids. They're doing projects, they're doing hands-on. It's very engaging and active learning within the classroom. Uh, kids are up and moving, and it, it's not, it does not look like your tradi traditional kindergarten classroom at all. It is developmentally appropriate, <clears throat> and children are moving at their pace and learning using the mater uh, appropriate materials and activities for the lesson. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, so as, as we get into doing this, I would just advocate for, um, you know, tracking to the extent that we can sort of the metrics of what's working here so that we know what to continue to do and what things um, might not work as well. So thank you. And if, if I can just piggyback on that, even thinking about the three-year-old space, um, th that transition, right, into that environment and having a space and, you know, kind of seamlessly moving into the pre-K space into kindergarten as well. So we've been thinking about um, that transition. It, it is a transition for three-year-olds. And so we want to make sure that we have the time and space to make sure that with that transition they have a solid foundation as they move throughout their journey. Thank you. We have Dr. Namba McKinney, then we have Ms. Mays, Mrs. Masters, and then Dr. Gentry. Oh, and then Ms. Bugs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I really uh, appreciate and, and love the fact that we're venturing into the birth to, to five-year-old um, really program. Um, I know Christian last year talked a lot about how our children are coming in one or two years behind. And so the work in early learning that we are beginning to do and really beginning to look like, look at is really, um, if we look at it from an equity perspective, is really leveling the playing field so students or children who, not on, who, who didn't have the opportunity before now have the opportunity, and we're setting them up to be um, successful as they go into our K through 12 trajectory. So I really appreciate that work. I'm very familiar with the pre-K program and the creative curriculum. It is a phenomenal program for play-based and developmentally appropriate learning within our early learning programs, um, and I see it. Not, I've seen it in in MPS and across um, other early other early learning platforms related to that. Um, I am um, really interested in, um, there has been questions that have already been asked around outcomes and accountability. Um, what I would like to see is sustainability in this program and what we're doing, um, kind of looking at timeline and rolling out in this implementation. How are we monitoring that and looking at that? And then how do we make this sustainable? Because we know based on research and what we see that this is something that's needed as we continue you to do that, how do we tap into resources and grants and programs to ensure the sustainability of that? Because we know community partners can kind of fluctuate, um, but we want to make sure that not only are we look, measuring those outcomes and that accountability, but how do we make it sustainable and, and helpful? for our students and our families. Yeah, I, thank you. Um, all um, great feedback. And, you know, part of this was uh, stepping back as well and really just thinking about access and, and our process for families who are enrolling at in the early years um, in MMPS. And so um, some, of, some of the steps you see around the website and around the registration process are just things that we needed to step back, reflect on, and improve upon um, to, to support our families um, even more. We don't want a barrier within our system um, that keeps families from uh, providing um, their young people, their children, their babies, um, a great foundation um, from the beginning. And so um, when we're thinking about sustainability, um, we're, we're, we're thinking about it from, again, what can we, what can we reasonably and feasibly 
take care of now that there might not be any cost um, or, and definitely not a recurring cost to us to take on. And then we're building out um, over the next few years uh, what these strategies could look like um, on the ground for, for MMPS. And again, we've been pretty um, inspired by lots of the conversations um, that this is the space um, that we should be in um, and providing for our students, but we know we cannot do it alone. Um, as you've mentioned, we've got to um, continue to work closely with and coordinate with our community partners um, in this space who have all been doing great work. And so um, this is not to replace um, anything that our partners are currently doing, but really elevating and taking to scale, taking to scale access. And as you've been talking about, we've been we've been drilling home the equity piece, um, making sure that all of our students um, are, are starting with what they need so that they can be on the trajectory of success. Thank you for that. Um, as a follow-up to that, um, also um, we know across the state of Tennessee that there is a crisis for early learning programs for families. Um, and so I appreciate also in that that we're really looking at how we can support families, um, especially in our most under, underserved communities, um, to be able to provide that level of access and opportunity um, for families there. And so for me, I would really like to continue to watch this and look at this and see how I can advocate um, and help advocate in a way to provide the resources and, and that, that we need to ensure that this program is really going to be successful for families across our district. I'd also like to, you know, over, over time kind of measure its um, its outcomes um, to ensure that we're right on, on the right track or if we need to adjust accordingly, we can do so. Um, th this is a great opportunity um, to help fill in that gap. I know Head Start a couple of years ago went from four-year-olds to three-year-olds, and now I think they're taking two-year-olds. Um, our state is having a hard time finding early learning programs or people to start early pro learning programs um, to provide access within our communities. Nashville has a crisis around that. So so I really like the foresight that our district is, is moving in to, to be able to do that. So so thank you, and and we'll con hopefully continue to have these conversations. Yeah, and, and speaking of advocacy, since you used um, that word um, for the board, uh, we will need continued advocacy around extended learning programs. Um, that is something that we are um, still seeing a need of. We're seeing that K-12, but we're also seeing that in our um, early learning programs as well. And so part of our plan um, is working closely with Dr. Springer and Makita and their team um, to pair some of these offerings with other, other extended learning options as well. All right, thank you. Ms. Mays? Um, yes, just a couple of questions. First question, um, there was a mention of 600, 600 maybe plus on the waiting list. What area of town are we seeing the most um, children on a waiting list? Phyllis? <laughs> <laughs> the most children are in the southeast area, Bell Road, all of there. Most of those programs in that area are full to capacity. We have uh, early learning center. We thought that would help ease some of the wait lists, but more and more families are applying. And I think we've been tracking applications and more are still submitting applications even today. And so it's southeast. So... What we're talking about here is adding seats, right? So if we're able to um, execute in the way in which we've communicated today, it adds more seats. And that means more seats and supporting more of our, I'm going to say babies, but our young people. Um, so that's that's another kind of demand um, that we're feeling. And this, this doesn't stop. This will continue throughout the entire school year, more applications. And when you think about hundreds of students, uh, young people being on the wait list, um, eager to come in and be a part of a structured day program with a creative curriculum, it, 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 it activates you. It pushes you um, into responding to make sure that we can provide um, access in that space. Thank you. And um, I, ironically, am wearing the Panda <laughs> T-shirt. I was uh, lucky enough to be principal for a day at the Cambridge Early Learning Center, so I am really into this presentation tonight, so thank you for that. Um, one of the things that I will say, uh, I'm, I'm hearing everything, and I saw a lot of this in action. Um, I was able to see in action the play-based curriculum. It was amazing to see these little ones, um, I won't say perform, but interact 
in such a positive way. It was really amazing to see. Um, and to Ms. Player's uh, comments earlier, the population increase has already begun. Uh, I know that right now, after having a conversation with Mrs. Myrie, they are getting applications consistently, and they are waitlisting uh, students um, every single day. They don't have, if there's an opening, it gets filled as soon as it gets, as it said, becomes open. So um, it's a really great program. If you've never visited a pre K uh, program, I encourage you to do so. You will walk away with happiness and sunshine. Um, I also wanted to um, ask, I made a note here, just a second. Oh, no, we were talking about the population increase. Um, Partners are going to be extremely important, um, and I'm so glad that we are encouraging and connecting with those partners that will support the programs. They are extremely important to sustainability, as uh, Dr. Naba McKinney said. Um, I would encourage you to, I am also advocating for this program on at the highest level. Uh, whatever we need to do as board members, uh, you can count me in 100%. Again, witnessing that program and um, having an opportunity to speak with these little ones, it absolutely will make your day and you want to do all you can to help support the program. So I thank you for that presentation and uh, count on me 100% for whatever you need. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Mrs. Masters and Dr. Gentry. Can you? Okay. I just wanted to ask about space. So um, I think the big thing I'm wondering is, are we talking about uh, adding, like, one classroom in different elementary schools or potentially, like, there's an elementary school in my district that as they've added fifth grade, they're beyond capacity, yet they have a very popular pre-K program. So maybe just are we going to be looking at things like that because there's another school up the street that maybe isn't as full? And so... Could we, you know, tackle some of those issues that yeah. way? I appreciate the question. I think it speaks to the sustainability question as well, because I want to be clear that we've outlined the direction we want to go in, but it's not like these are going to go happen tomorrow, right? We want to investigate where's the greatest need that we can start and scale from there. Um, so the first thing to answer your question is we looked at the areas of need, as Phyllis mentioned, and also where do we have immediate space that's available? And when we intersect those two things, that's something that we could put in place rather quickly. Um, when we look at where there's need and there's not immediate space, then we have to look at what, what would that take and what are some ways around that potential obstacle. So um, we're in very close contact with our facilities uh, team, looking at available space. We've interacted with them several times to look at. We've got multiple spreadsheets. Where's the need? Where's the space? Where's the intersection point? Where can we start? We've got to start somewhere to get momentum and forward traction. So that's how we're thinking about it. But I think it speaks to, again, we're going to be very thoughtful thinking about sustainability long term. We're not going to just jump into having expansion immediately, you know, starting next year. So. Thank you. All right, Dr. Gentry. And Mrs. Buck. Thank you. So even in the, the start of the presentation, I was reminded of a quote from Desmond Tutu. And he says that there comes a point where we have to stop pulling people out of the river. We have to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. And this is what that feels like to me. Right, And so I would just ask that we kind of broaden our thinking, even beyond this sector, to say, you know, I hear concern about resources and concern about space. It's just one of those kinds of things. It's the right thing to do, and we've just got to figure it out. And if we look across the K through 12 continuum, where are those things that we've gotten right we found a way to bake it in to our norm. It's not a separately funded thing, but it's something that we do every day. And then you get to the point where you can take those resources and shift them further upstream, right? So I would encourage us to look for other opportunities to do what we're doing here. Where do we have resources that we're pouring in because the problem has gotten so big because we're addressing it so far upriver that if we were addressing it earlier, it wouldn't cost us as much because that's where your cost saving comes in. Because trust me, solving the, the, the issue of lack of preparation in kindergarten is much more expensive than dealing with it at a three-year-old. 
and addressing the inability to read in third grade costs you a whole lot more than addressing it in kindergarten. And we could do this all day, right? You can go further down the stream though. We're funding <clears throat> trying to fix six and seven and eight academic years of problems because they were not addressed earlier. So again, in concert with other members of the board, I applaud the effort. I would, I would additionally ask us to step back and look for other spaces and areas where we can do that. Where can we get ahead of um, some of the issues we're seeing in funding uh, in higher grades and further up the K through 12 continuum? Thank you. Ms. Bugs? Thank you. So for the last maybe four or five years, I've been working to really understand what's happening in the birth to five space across Nashville, understanding what's happening with daycares, and then of course became a parent myself. And there was the data that really stuck with me that something upwards, when you disaggregate the data, 60% of black, brown, differently abled, or students who come from a, dis uh, a, a low income family are coming into first grade a, grade a full grade level behind. You know, those of us who are educators know that you could be three months behind or four months ahead, but to be a full 10 months behind before the baby is even, or before the, the young person is even um, really learned from MNPS says that families need more resources. And it's something that I experienced as a three-year-old 3, K, three -year -old pre K parent that I learned so much about what I should be teaching Christopher from just the other parents that I was around or from the, 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 the teacher. And so along winded way of me saying that this is of course close to my heart so I appreciate that you all are even considering this and I think it might be helpful to show the next time this rolls around when you're ready to start rolling out a first phase or a second phase show us what that data looks like now disaggregate it as best you can to help us to understand the equity side of this that it's for all students it will benefit every single child but will it will benefit the most historically disadvantaged most but also if you could show us the type of assessments that you're using to help us think through help us help you all think through what measurements could we take and use for advocacy purposes? What will help you all as educators and as experts kind of think through the next phase of this? So, you know, being able to show me how you assess the child's physical preparation, his, their um, ability to, to sound out words, all of those things that prepare for literacy. So I think just having those assessments available, data available for us. And then, yes, the city and the state have both pulled together a bunch of different partners to decide how they want to move forward in addressing this literacy need between that birth and five-year-old space. If you could disaggregate that for us, and again, I'm not asking for this in an immediate term, but the next time, when we're ready to roll out a phase out, what is it looking like across Tennessee. Give us some quick updates on data. I think all of that will just help us to wrap our minds around it, but also help us advocate to the greater national community about what this looks like and how they can support. We're Thank looking you. forward to it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ms. Tyler, you had another question. Yes. Um, I just wanted to say that um, we talked a little bit about, you know, how are we measuring, how are we making sure this is going to be successful, and I just really want to put a plug in to say that we don't tie the success of a pre-K program to academic tests, because that has been long proven to not be the measurement of whether or not it's successful, um, because you tend to see the long-term um, effect in more behavioral outcomes. Um, there have been lots of studies from the 70s, 80s. There's a new longitudinal study that was just released last year, I think, from Universal Pre-K in Boston for like 97 to 2003, somewhere around there. Um, and those kids, they found that the ones who had preschool um, were less likely to get suspended, less likely to skip class, less likely to end up in juvie, less likely to have um, problems in with when they're adults being in jail, in and out of jail, more likely to be employed, less likely to end up on welfare, less likely to, um, um, let me see what else, I jotted some things down real quick. Um, they showed increased economic gains, um, decreased public spending on them for all of these kids just because they went to pre-K. So please do not tie whether or not this is a success based on an academic test, because that's not the success that we're hoping for. We're hoping for the long-term behavioral, how are you as a human being, as you move forward through the world, how are you feeling as far as how you conduct yourself, how you um, see the world around you and your place in it, and, and you know, are you able to problem solve, are you able to... Um, figure out how to problem solve things in a way that may or may not translate on an academic test, but will in real life skills. 
So um, I, I really, I think it's important that we're always measuring and that we're making sure that what we're doing is successful. But I don't think that pre-K to um, Tennessee Ready, that's not the measurement that will show whether or not our success is. I think you'll see some residuals in there where you will see things go up and we will see positive gains there. But to me, it's less about do our scores look great in third grade and in eighth grade and moving forward and, and more about what does Nashville look like when these kids who were in pre-K graduate and are part of our society. And that to me is what schools should be about. What do these kids look like when they graduate and are part of society? Did they have the best SAT score in the world, or are they gainfully employed? Are they um, able to have a happy home life and a family that they're proud of and, and that they um, feel like they are part of the world around them in a positive way, that they feel good about themselves? And I think that's meaningful, and it's harder to measure that. Um, <clears throat> But in a lot of ways, it's more important than what one test in third grade tells us. Um, so I just really want to advocate for, you know, yes, we should make sure that we're doing this appropriately. Yes, we the play-based programs are fabulous. We should definitely continue that. I, I love that, like Dr. Nabal McKinney said, I have been very impressed with them. I've seen them. I think they do great. But um, whether or not it's successful long term, I don't think we should tie it to another academic test. Um, I think we should be looking at larger outcomes, if that makes sense. Dr. Gentry, and then I will speak. So if we are as earlier was voiced about funding and making sure that the money we're getting from the council, I don't think waiting until those kinds of things is going to be the response that they're looking for. So whatever we call it, academic outcomes, testing, whatever, whatever the metrics are as was started here, um, we need to identify those so we should see something, right? We, we're, we, we can't be doing this today hoping that something 10, 15 years from now is going to be, going to be different. So I'm looking forward to seeing whatever we're using to measure the impact we're having by starting sooner. Um, and so still the right thing to do. Those could be great long-term residual um, outcomes, and it is the, I guess, holistic goal of public education in general. But for these, we need some near-term, <laughs> quantifiable uh, targets or, or measurements that I'm looking forward to, to discussing. It's fine. Just not the academic. Thank you. Um, early childhood is um, dear to my heart, and so I think to Dr. Gentry's earlier point that there's there's definite data uh, that shows that there is a financial benefit to early childhood education uh, just in the community costs, and that that saves, of course, in the long run, as Dr. Gentry was saying, um, upriver. That, of course, is just one huge benefit of it for us as a community, and I hear that my colleagues want multiple ways of us managing and showing that there's a good return on this investment. My belief is that it is a good return on an investment, not only as a moral thing that we need to provide to our families, but there's also a lot of great studies that show that it helps not only as we've talked about the residual growth in um, literacy, but also in health and nutrition, also in vaccination rates, also in ongoing growth, and all not just numeracy and literacy, though that is, of course, a focus of us. I also am excited about it because I think it will help us with our ongoing enrollment and outreach as we try to show that if you are a Nashville family, you belong to us and that we care for you. And I think that that's important for us to start within our early childhood area. My encouragement is, is that we continue to partner with TEIS, Tennessee's Early Inter uh, Intervention Services, especially as we are starting to have an increase of three-year-olds because those students, if you do not know, start to come to our schools at the three-year-old mark um, instead of only receiving their services through TEIS. And then, of course, with our pediatricians as well and health departments to increase those kind of collaboration of making sure that it is, again, an equitable service that we're providing. And I appreciate it. I know it's um, definitely wanted in South and Southeast Nashville, as we have mentioned, as it's been wanted for many years. So I'm excited that we're discussing it. I appreciate the focus on it. I look forward to discussing it some more. And of course, all this additional data that we're wanting. I like the data focus, guys. So thank you so much. Um, 
So that ends the director's report? Yes, ma'am. All you. right. So we will go to public participation. Thank you both so much for giving us your time this evening. Public participation is this evening, and we have currently 20 people signed up. Our list is up on the board. I ask, which is a little bit different in case you've not been here, um, maybe recently since I've been chair, I ask that you look up here to see where you are in line, and we try to line up kind of the three people in a row. So if you are number two, if you'll go ahead and get in line, so we can kind of go ahead and keep it started. So the first three people are number one, two, and three. I may not be calling names, so if you can go ahead and get up here, if you are, I'll start us off, I guess, with names, because I see some hesitancy. Uh, Erica. Lauren and Robin, maybe, they're, maybe there's hesitancy because they're not here. <laughs> that may be the case. All right. Four, Kather. All right. Five, Ivory. There we have somebody. Thank you, Ivory. <laughs> and thank you, Mr. Moth, for coming into line. Good evening. My name is Ivory Brown, and I have the honor and privilege to serve as principal of Independence Academy High School under Intrepid College Prep. My journey at Intrepid can only be described in two words, beautiful chaos. I came to this school with a vision of what my experience would be and how I would grow as a professional. The manifestation of that vision ended up looking incredibly different than I had originally hoped. But I can honestly say that I am exactly where I want to be. To walk into a school expecting the traditional experience, then have our time shaken by a tornado and then a global pandemic. I went from living in a familiar space to leading a school through one of education's most difficult seasons. And I want to be clear, I did it imperfectly and it was hard. I had to learn who I was as a leader. I had to learn and unlearn what a good leader is. But the community that was fostered at Intrepid allowed me to experience that challenge and transparently be imperfect in a way that was supportive and safe. My philosophy around being a coach, a manager, a visionary has been completely transformed in the four years that I have served at Intrepid. Under the leadership of Abigail Rocky and Christina McDonald, I've learned the true meaning of purpose over power and caring for my people. To lead with my heart and to dream big, to lead from a space of inspiration over compliance, to be a problem solver, a third way thinker, and to not be limited by how school has always been done. Ignite passion, seek knowledge, inspire bravery. They are not just words painted in our gym, but the very wind beneath our wings that push us towards actualizing our mission to unlock unlimited futures for every member of our community. And I can say with great confidence that not only were my passions ignited here, but I get to live out my passions daily. I am encouraged and given space to seek knowledge, to improve my practice, leadership skills, and do some of the deep personal work required to leave a community, to lead a community of 500 plus people. And I have been allowed to be brave and inspire bravery in our staff and student body. It has truly been my greatest professional joy to coach and lead an incredible group of young leaders who are honestly the most beautiful and most challenging reflections of me. With 91% of my leadership team returning over the last two years, we are growing and learning together in a way that I have never seen a team grow together in my almost decade in working in schools. We get to live out our core values boldly and unapologetically by each other's side in support of our staff, 82% of which are returning teammates, and in service of our students who in 2021 boasted the highest college attendance rate in Davidson County. My hope is that my words today have been a model of living out our core values and have proven to you that the work happening at Intrepid College Prep is good work and is leaving an impact that is lasting beyond just the Antioch community. And it is my hope that I get to continue to serve as Independence Academy High School's principal and continue to drive towards being the best school community in Davidson County to be a part of. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next we have Karen McIntyre. And then Mr. Mock. Good evening. In an earlier visit, in an earlier visit, I shared an African story about a hummingbird a story I learned from Wangari Maathai, the Nobel Peace Prize winning woman who single-handedly reforested Kenya. Then last time I told you my favorite Sufi story about Nasruddin, who will play the one note that's worth playing until all the other men in the village find the pitch. Today's story is a little different. Did you know that a woman is actually the founder of climate science? 
You don't, because Eunice Foote, 166 years ago, connected the dots and published Circumstances Affecting the Heat of the Sun's Rays and presented it in August of 1856 to the American Association for the Advancement of Science. But for a reason that all the women here will appreciate, Eunice wasn't allowed to read her own paper. Instead, it was read by Joseph Henry, the secretary of the Smithsonian, and she was soon forgotten. Three years later, John Tyndall, an Irish scientist, published a work similar to hers on the heat-trapping gases. Now, I will leave it to you to decide whether he knew about her work or not. You see, in 1856, Eunice's paper was published alongside a piece about colorblindness that John had written. But the point is that 166 years ago, a woman got it. But for 166 years, we've watched as extractive policies have destroyed our planet. And the Scientific American stated just recently that we're now facing an insect apocalypse. North America has lost 3 billion birds in a decade, two-thirds two-thirds of all wild creatures have gone. They're gone missing. One million species face extinction, and 40% of America's plants also face that fate. I personally have gone through the stages of grief over this understanding as it's grown within me. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. But Douglas Talamay says we must add another stage it's called action. You see, you can't accept this because you all have small children. But none of us can accept it because human beings can't survive on this planet without nature. My friend Jack Mazingira, a climate activist from Kenya, is at COP27 right now. And last week he sent me pictures and a story about the thousands of animals, wildlife, that have died in Africa and the people who are starving in Kenya, being driven mass, mass movements by this terrible drought that they're experiencing. And it brought me back to that first story I told you. Can I have 15 more? I may, I'm sorry, I may not give you 15 more, but may I speak to you after the meeting? Sure. Thank you. Mr. Chris Moth? Uh, good evening and happy Election Day. I'm Chris Moth, a proud parent of two MNPS graduates, Hillsboro and Hume Fogg. My youngest is an eighth grader at J.T. Moore Middle. I want to thank you for making tough choices during the pandemic. Your actions saved hundreds, if not thousands, of lives. I'm here today asking you to use that same energy to build back confidence in our school system fundamentally. Attitudes are changing in the public. I ran for school board on a laser clear platform of pushing back against the state and saying no to privatization. I won the more activist early vote by a couple of hundred, even as I lost the final count by 89, a single percent. Think about that 1% with me. In affluent D8, where so many attend private schools, over 49% of primary voters want a school system which supports every child. Indeed, across all of Nashville, each new Tennessean and Vanderbilt poll reports plummeting support for privatization. Even with this obvious change in public opinion, your policies on this board cling to creating child winners and losers. You roll out Choice Day, and you imagine we all love the lottery games. Sorry, but the tension and the stress is not remotely pleasant, not at all. For our family's part in Choice Day, we toured Hillsborough High School. Two great moms and a student presented all the new facilities. Thanks again for the lovely renovation. But even with the lovely facilities, respected teachers and concerned friends still give us that look and ask, where will your daughter go to school next year? Inevitably, they next follow with the well-intentioned advice that we should gamble in the Hume Fog Lottery and leave our integrated school pathway behind. Why have you created this system where so many in our community urge us to leave our zone schools? It's getting worse. Yesterday, I was shocked to see that my property taxes are now subsidizing a billboard from the Valor Charter School that this board approved. The Valor billboard hangs right over Hillsboro High School and proclaims to the world that Valor and not Hillsboro is top ranked, that Valor and not MNPS provides lottery free education all the way from fifth grade to 12th. In exchange for their billboard of insults to our integrated school, you let Valor run its own lottery to pick up the kids who don't get into Megs. I've left pictures of this billboard so that you can see it for yourself. What billboards are you guys planning to take out to compete with this nonsense? 
It's election day. It's 2022. It's time for action. It's time to make changes in your system. There are so many obvious and zero cost improvements that you can make. One super simple zero cost idea. Let's let every eighth grader in this city compete for a slot at Hume Fogg and the 1999 auto pathways that make winners and losers out of our nine-year-olds. Finally, parents could believe that it is A-OK -okay to stay in our zone schools all the way through eighth grade. Every eighth grade, if every eighth grader had an equal shot at Hume Fogg from, they had it back in 1981 to 1999, and it was a lot less stressful then. And I think if we got back to that, we have a better system. Thank you very much. Get to work. Thank you. Rebecca, Rebecca Newton, and then we'll have Liza, and then Richard. Yes, ma'am. You might want to pull it down a little bit. There, there you go. go. Thank you. Hello, my name is Rebecca Newton. I came to outdoor education as a parent volunteer in 2014 when my youngest daughter and I moved to Bellevue and she entered the fourth grade. I brought a lifetime of gardening with me and I was so happy to walk up to Westmead Elementary and discover their garden. Turned out that the librarian, Karen McIntyre, needed help. We proceeded to tend and plant and take the children outside to learn. They learned where their food comes from. They watched a bluebird pair nest and raise their hatchlings at eye level. My daughter learned that asparagus is perennial, the first edible vegetable in their spring garden. Many kids have never put their hands in soil or seen a seed whatsoever. My daughter and her classmates were released from their classrooms and learned together to build vegetable beds. They learned how tiny carrot seeds are. They learned to be quiet and respectful of one another, to find sanctuary at their school. It is wondrous. Children cannot love and preserve a planet that they do not directly experience. It's a misperception that plants and wildlife are the only things kids learn in nature education. STEM ed, what the stats tell us so many of our children need most, is complemented by outdoor education with its many opportunities to integrate lessons across the curriculum. Young children measured, counted, and logged their data, wrote about their experiences, integrating language, stu integrating language studies with environmental science. Stemming violence in our society and ensuring the mental health of our children is everyone's number one priority. Is this not the number one priority of everyone on this board? The most important benefit of outdoor education is that it provides respite and healthy contrast to the current negative influences in American culture. At home, our kids play violent video games, see violent movies, their parents may be stressed to make a living and pay for gas. The joy, teamwork, and sanctuary of our beautiful natural world provides solace. We must help them find that. Numerous outdoor education programs exist in your district and stand ready to help other schools do this, but our district, you, lack leadership on this. Please stop dithering around and delaying establishing, establishing an MMPS sustainable, sustainable Schools Program. This group has attended every meeting this year. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Liza, and then after that we have Richard and Paul. Good evening, Dr. Battle and members of the board. My name is Liza Ramage, and I'm chair of the Education Task Force of Nashville Organized for Action and Hope, or NOAA. I live at 1400 Rosa L. Parks Boulevard. I first want to say how happy I am and how pleased our task force is with the many accomplishments of MMPS over the last year. Since one of our primary concerns is eliminating the racial disparity in school discipline, especially keeping black and brown kids in school and learning, we're delighted to have new employees and systems in place to address these problems. The advocacy coaches and advocacy centers in elementary schools are intended to do exactly this. 
the restorative practice assistants are in place to accomplish this goal as well. This is great. It is exciting to us that East, Maplewood, and Stratford have each significantly increased their EBSO opportunities this year. In addition, we are gratified that the equity roadmap is now in place, and we are pleased that the resolution for equity in, in advanced academics and the new equity policy have both been passed by the school board. Thank you so much. Our concern here today is that no clear specific goals have been created to focus equity action going forward. We are all in favor of equity for our students, but without any measurable goals, it is difficult to assess if progress is actually good, mediocre, or even poor. Naturally, we all want good or even excellent progress, but with no goals against which to measure progress, anything might look acceptable. We have brought here today two petitions, one to Dr. Battle and one to each school board member with a total of 400 signatures. Um, these petitions express the desire of local Nashville citizens to see clear, measurable public goals and outcomes for increasing equity in advanced academics and for reducing the racial disparities in discipline. We know that twice as many white kids as black kids are enrolled in GATE, the elementary um, gifted program, and we know that more than three times as many black kids as white kids are suspended or suspe expelled from school. Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you. Next we have Richard, then Paul. Uh, good evening, Dr. Battle, Chair Elrod, and the members of the board. Uh, I was here a couple of months ago just to talk about outdoor education, sustainability. All this is it's a, can be overwhelming, but I want to focus tonight just on outdoor education. Uh, I've not met Rebecca before, but I could just say what she said. And uh, what I want to do is uh, throw out a few options. I mentioned uh, last uh, two months ago that the National Wildlife Foundation has an excellent booklet, 40-page booklet. And so in addition to that, they have another newer booklet um, on School Yard Habitats Planning Guide. And so I would like to make those uh, web links available to you, however, however I can do that. The, the planning guide is a more recent publication and has more current research uh, in it. Another option for outdoor education, school, school yards can become a Tennessee Smart Yard. That's a fairly new program by the Department of Agriculture at U University of Tennessee. And so that would be another way to tip your toe in the water and see how it's going to go. And it's a very comprehensive program that doesn't just deal with native plants, but water, water management as well. And then lastly, there's a publication from 2022 where a group of researchers took, they started with 14,000 uh, research papers based on keyword search and winnowed it down to 144 research papers that point out the advantages of outdoor education in the public school system. So I would like to make that article available to you as well. Um, so guiding, learn, guiding learning about nature helps us all appreciate the complexity of nature's food web. This appreciation is in increasingly important to the future of our planet. We need a populace that understands that in order to act effectively on the multiple cascading environmental crises that are present now and likely to be around in the, well into the future. So my request is that the subcommittee be appointed of members of the board to look into the benefits and obstacles in increasing the outdoor education throughout the school system. It's already being done in some places, but it could be expanded. If all goes well, I will look forward to educators around the country coming to Nashville, not just to learn about their, your academy program, but also to learn about the outdoor learning program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there a way I can make, can I send you, and if you approve it, distribute to the board some links? Yes, you may send Thank that to me, no problem, and I will give that to you at the end. Thank you. Next we have Paul, hello Paul, and then Dr. Pendergrass. 
Hello again, Paul Prill, Master Gardener, board member of Middle Tennessee Wildlands. We've heard the numbers about the decline in insect populations, other microfauna. It's disturbing news, but not inevitable. In places where citizens and cities practice sustainability, populations of these animals are recovering. In Oregon, the Fender's blue butterfly has recovered from a 50-year re record of zero sightings, none in 50 years, to a healthy population now. A recovery driven by replanting of Kincaid's lupine by conservation groups in connection with cities, corporations, and citizens. Non-migratory butterfly populations in Florida are on the rise for the same reason. Every habitat helps. Several butterfly gardens spread across few schools can begin to make a difference and set an example for other schools and parent organizations which support them. Dr. Adam Baker of the University of Kentucky has developed simple plans for smallish gardens, one to 200 square feet, using the milkweed species needed by monarch butterflies for laying eggs and using companion plants for pollen and nectar. Baker's conclusion, plant, and they will come, along with many other native plants and pollinators. The simplest way to help plant is to is to plant. Simplest way to help is to plant one of the keystone trees in each schoolyard, which will provide habitat for insects and the birds that eat them. Oak is the best species, but not too far behind it are native plum and cherry, birch, maples, and hickories. The Cumberland Compact and Root Nashville have a goal of planting 500,000 trees by 2050. 170 trees, one for each school district, may not sound like much, but joined together with other efforts in neighborhood yards, in parks, on golf courses, and on city and state property in Davidson County, it will help combat the urban heat effect, provide beauty in the spring and fall, and create opportunities for learning. I worry that as students get accustomed to seeing fewer birds, butterflies, and bumblebees, they will not notice or care much about the loss of the next 5% and the next 5% after that. We need to help them to understand the importance of the ecosystem they live in and give them hands-on experience, which will reinforce their role in preserving that ecosystem. Years ago, I was on the planning committee for the Nashville School Garden Coalition. I would ask that you consider reviving and staffing that group to help schools consider ways to use outdoor spaces for learning. <coughs> if that's not possible at this time, encourage five to ten additional schools to plant a small butterfly pollinator garden. At the very least, plant a native keystone tree at every school. Thank you for caring about sustainability. Thank you, Mr. Prill. Dr. Pendergrass? Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the school board, and Dr. Battle. I am Dr. Paula Pendergrass, the current Vice President of MNEA. It's November, and many of us are celebrating fall weather, football, family, and friends as we look ahead to the Thanksgiving holiday. But Thanksgiving isn't the only day to celebrate in the month of November. American Education Week is celebrated the week prior to the Thanksgiving week. First observed in 1921, American Education Week is an opportunity to celebrate public education, to inform the community of our public school's accomplishments and needs, to secure cooperation and support from the public and to honor individuals who are making a difference in ensuring every child receives a quality education. Tuesday is Family Day, where parents and guardians are invited to experience how a school day goes for their children. Research shows that parental involvement in school improves student achievement, reduces absenteeism, and strengthens confidence among parents in their children's education. On Wednesday, we celebrate education support paraprofessionals, the contributions of our school support staff. All educators, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, janitorial staff, paraprofessionals, SROs, and secretaries play a vital role on, in the educational team and in the lives of students both inside and outside of the classroom. Thursday is education for a day. On this day, community leaders are invited to work as an employee in the school, performing all duties of a teacher for a full day. And Friday is Substitute Educators Day, when we celebrate people who are always available to replace regular teachers when there is a sudden emergency or temporary leave. As we take this month to express our gratitude for all that we have, the Metro National Education Association includes our educators on the list of things for which we are thankful. 
The educators in our district work very hard every day to ensure that our students have the best learning experience possible, but it takes every educator working in strong partnership with our district leadership and our school board to make MMPS the best place in which to learn, teach, and live. Thank you for your continued support for our, te our students, our educators, in public schools. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Kendall, then Nicole, then Tamala. Hi, my name is Kendall Maupin. I'm a natural propel, propel powerful parent. I am, I'm here to tell you things you already know, but some for some reason don't talk about. And since no one here wants to talk about it out loud, we are here to turn your silence into purpose for our parents. <clears throat> We don't need to tell you that all our celebrations in September were slaps in the face of children assigned to the state's low-performing schools, priority schools. We don't need to tell you that priority schools and even some reward schools are failing black, brown, and low-income children at crumb rates. The same other schools have less than 5% of children, 5% of children reading on grade level. There are schools on reward lists that are still under educating more than 80% of students' population, 80%. We have 17 elementary schools where 90% or more are not at grade level in ELA or math, 90%. We have 34 elementary schools where 75% are not at grade level in ELA or math. No, thank you. Thank you. Next we have Nicole and then Tamala. Afternoon, board. My name is Nicole, and I am a Nashville powerful parent leader. Maybe I don't need to tell you that children who can't read end up in jail or relying on government support, what society calls the school-to-prison pipeline. You probably already know that thousands of black and brown MNPS children are not reading and doing math like they should on your watch. Maybe you don't know that more than half of the schools that are on the 2022 priority list have been on the priority school list since 2015. That's seven years. The following schools are Antioch Middle, Moses McKissick Middle, Belshire Elementary, Ida B. Wells Elementary, Haynes Middle, Jerry Baxter Middle, Maplewood High, Madison Middle, Tom Joy Elementary, Whites Creek High, and Wright Middle. Eleven schools full of children who are destined to fail. We are tired of y'all spinning the news coming out of these schools. What if your child attended a school that is consistently low performing decade after decade and you have no other options because you are not connected to high powered people? But you know what? That's a stupid question. You will never let your children go to these schools, except if you're willing to sacrifice your child. No, thank you. Next is Tamala and then Thomas. Good evening. My name is Tamala, and I am a Nashville Propel Powerful Parent Leader. I probably don't need to remind Dr. Battle of her words, but I will anyway. And I quote, 
In Metro schools, we are focused every day on making sure every student is known, understood, supported, cared for, and on a path to success, end quote, Dr. Battle. Let's talk about the most serious crime being committed under the guise of education. Children who go from kindergarten to middle school and then high school without the possibility of attending a school that can prepare them for life. This is a travesty. We have thousands of students who spend their entire school year in a school that performs in the bottom 5% of schools in the state. Julian Bond said, a child that goes to school for 12 years and gets six years worth of education, that's violence. If students in Nashville's priority schools are known, understood, supported, and cared for is news to us. No, thank you. Next is Thomas, then Torvis. Thomas, not here. I'm Torvis Gardner, and I'm a Nashville Propel, powerful parent. It's 12. Okay. We have 12 traditional high schools, four on the priority school list, seven are targeted. By the state is poorly serving black and brown students. And this includes East and Hillsborough. Let me also point out Fox 17 report on Glencliff High School labeled a dropout factory. A dropout factory is defined by researchers in John Hopkins University as high schools with less than 60% graduation rate. Glencliff High School. The bottom line is that most Marginalized children in Nashville have no real access to high-performing high schools. This is true definition of school with the prison pipeline. No, thank you. Next is Cheyenne, then Victoria, then David. My name is Cheyenne Kutch. I am a powerful parent leader with two children, and I'm the leader of the youth in my church and majority of the children in my church go to a priority school. A lot of children I know, including mine, have IEPs. This is a big issue in the district. They mean everything to me and their education means more. I do this work that I do because I'm committed to my children's success as well as children around me. When schools fail our children, we know what happens to them. They will experience jail and or death. They won't have the same opportunities as the 12 of you sitting up there. I'm here to ask Dr. Battle to do her job. No, thank you. Next is Victoria. Hello, my name is Victoria Gordon, and I'm a Nashville, Nashville Propel Powerful Parent Leader. If, if you are truly fighting for equity, you, we'd, be, we'd like you to do something about it instead of talking about it. For children trapped in a feeder pattern of persistently low performing schools that consistently live on the priority, priority list, there must be an exit ramp. There must be a lifeboat for, for these children and families. Parents must, must be able to have access to high-performing high school of their choice. Transportation provided by the district. As a community, we cannot keep ignoring the children over here or the families struggling to find housing as they, are, as they can truly afford. The violence in these areas are tremendous. These things work together. And shame on us for turning our backs year after year, decade after decade, generation after generation. As the district, we, we need a concrete plan to grow student performance in ELA and math by 10% each year for the next five years. Tanashi Coates said, the destroyers will, will rarely be held accountable. Mostly, they will receive pension. Our children's lives hangs in the balance while some of you pad your pensions and our children and our children are likely dying. 
What are we going to do about it? Lastly, we have David. Hello. Good evening, Chair, members of the board. My name is David Dagafa, and I live at 4704 Derbyshire Drive in Antioch, Tennessee. I have been at IA for two years now, and I'm here today to tell you all my experience at the school. Independence Academy is, in fact, not the first high school I attended. I originally went to Antioch High freshman year, before the pandemic came along. To be completely honest, when I found out my mother was switching me out to another school, I was furious. I had finally felt as if I had grown into my role within my friend group, and school was going okay. What more could I have asked for? What I did not realize was that I was suffering as a person. Looking back on it now, I realized I had become comfortable with the person I was. I felt that my current work ethic and effort would be just enough to get me through the rest of my life. This is wrong. And I saw that firsthand when I attended my 10th grade human geography class with Mr. Paul. It was the first time I genuinely saw that a social science class could need effort. I felt it in Miss Nation's geometry class. And math as a whole, which I saw and still see as a personal strong suit, was gonna need some note taking if I wanted to succeed. I initially did not take this well, but the support I had from my teachers and staff uh, got me through it and allowed me to succeed. From there, I was able to push past this sense of complacency and look towards the future. I'm submitting applications in the next few weeks to UTK, NYU, and University of Illinois, UC, among other top universities, armed with the knowledge that I have done well here at IA. Intrepid served as a second opportunity and a wake-up call. This rather rude awakening was long overdue, and I know that if this school wasn't here, I wouldn't be the person I am today. Thank you for your time. Thank you. That concludes public participation. Before we go to governance issues, I must address that, um, though the group has, of course, removed themselves from the room, um, I would like to address that we do indeed care about our students and that that is why we all do the work that we do. And um, many of us, actually, the, all of us, I don't have any colleagues on this board that have children whose children do not attend our district-run schools, and I'm quite proud of that. So I appreciate that from my colleagues, and I appreciate everybody that's made the time to attend with us, public participation, especially on a busy election night. Mm -hmm. Oh, and we also don't have pensions, and there's <laughs> nine of us. So I want to make sure that we have some clarity. All right, we now have our governance issues. The um, agenda was adopted earlier, so, hold on one second. Let me get to my, let me get my bearings here for a second. Okay. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda items as listed? Was the consent agenda as listed? Second. Second. Do we have any discussion? <coughs> All right, thank you. The approval has been first and seconded. In favor of this approval, please raise your hand. All but, oh, it is now, <laughs> it's now everyone. I'm sorry. So sorry, I was like staring at you, Dr. Berthia. Thank you. All right. That moves us on to announcements. So, do we want to, yeah, we will start with Dr. Gentry. Hey. Um, thank you for that, and thank you all for a good meeting and great discussion earlier on uh, the director's report. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm a different kind of exhausted when I'm when I'm with y'all. It's a good exhausted, and I, I do greatly appreciate it. I just want to just take a second to um, give a shout out to the um, Haynes Trinity Neighborhood Coalition. Um, over the past few years, under the leadership of Yolanda Hockett, they have been working with local leaders and local businesses across the uh, North Nashville community to raise funds, and they give cash donations to our neighborhood schools. Um, and so their last donations went to Cumberland Elementary and White's Creek. And so I just want to thank Yolanda 
for her steadfastness uh, on that on those efforts. And um, trust me, if she ever gets a hold of you, she will not let go until until you uh, engage uh, on behalf of the students. So I want to thank her and all the members of the um, Haynes neighborhood um, Haynes Trinity Neighborhood Coalition for the work that they do for their support and advocacy of public schools. We know we are not perfect, and we know that there is work to do. Um, what I think I do appreciate Dr. Battle is is understanding what's uh, uh, been pl put on her plate and placed on her shoulders of responsibility, and she's accepted that, and she says it all the time. Um, and uh, I just want to, again, just thank this board and all of our community partners who have rolled up their sleeves to help us uh, in this um, huge endeavor that changes all the time. You know, that's that's really the, the kind of the rub there, right, is the mix that we have to work with, the problem that we have to solve is never the same from school year to school year. So again, thank you to my colleagues. Thank you to Dr. Battle. And thank you um, to Yolanda Hockett and the uh, Neighborhood Coalition. Thank you. District 3. Thank you. Um, First, I just want to congratulate the Blue Ribbon teachers from District 3. Um, three teachers from Cora Howe, which is very exciting. Sarah Anderson, Edward Haybeck, and Jason Powell. Um, also have Erin Cochran from Stratford, Sarah Godshaw from Amqui, and Miss Megan Nave from Van Mills Elementary. So that's um, very exciting for our district. Um, I had a big day on October 26th. That was just like all the school things day for me. And I just wanted to say some thank yous. Um, I started the morning at Goodlettsville Elementary where they had just, the kindergarten class had just finished reading a book about Mr. Bojangles tap dancing. And I had the opportunity to tap dance with all of the kindergartners. And it was amazing. I knew about it at the last meeting, but it's not the sort of thing I wanted to say ahead of time because I didn't want to risk anybody like deciding to come and watch. But <laughs> we did get some really cute pictures and it was amazing. And I think um, Jennifer Thomas and Principal Tracy Gibson for welcoming me. Um, and then I was honored to be able to, to talk on WPLN's This Is Nashville um, about the education savings legislation here in the state of Tennessee. And that was a, a very interesting conversation to have. Um, it's on their website if anybody would like to listen to it. Um, and then I went on to Inglewood Elementary School where um, the mayor came to tour the after school programs there and to announce the um, launch of the out of school time program locator. So you, anyone can go to nashvillez.org and go to that locator and see what sort of out of school activities are available to your kids. So that was very exciting. Um, so that was my day on October 26th. Um, I want to thank Charlie Friedman and Nashville Classical for inviting me to come out to their school November 4th. I also saw our former colleague John Little that day um, and attended their community meeting and just chatted about all things Nashville Classical. Um, want to remind folks that we are right now in our MMPS benefits enrollment period, November 1 through 30. Um, mmpsbenefits.org. I also highly recommend to staff, if you haven't bookmarked benefits at mmps.org in your email, you really should because that's where you hear about all the exciting things happening with benefits. Um, there are still two opportunities to get your COVID-19 booster. Tomorrow right here and Thursday at Hunters Lane High School in District 3. Shout out again to District 3. Um, so just you can sign up for that at the benefits site. Um, I'm sorry, I have a lot. One more thing. One more thank you um, to the organization Step Up, who put on a Money Matters workshop this past Saturday at the Cal Turner Family Center. Um, and provided transportation um, from and to Stratford High School. And I just think that's really exciting when our community partners help to eliminate barriers like around transportation. So I was very grateful for that. And um, I do just want to say, I just want to add one more little note. Um, and that is that, yes, we don't have pensions <laughs> through, through um, the schools. But on top of that, we, um, 
we are we are juggling a lot of different things. You know, I had that very fun day on October 26th where I got to tap dance with children. Um, and then I was sort of serving in the position of being an advocate for our schools around the possibility of voucher, a voucher program taking funding away. So even though you may sometimes grow frustrated that your specific issue isn't being addressed as quickly as you would like, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're dithering away our time. Um, we are having to prioritize the work that we're doing as a board and and work to you know offer as much support as we can to the district. Um, my response time on email is not what it used to be. Um, but I will eventually get back to you and and we definitely I think all of us I think I speak for everyone when I say we want to be helpful and be of service to all of our constituents but please understand um, that there's a lot to take on so that's it Thank you. district four Oh, that would be me. <laughs> Sorry, I'm processing so now today. I, I know, it's the end of the day. Um, I started out at the polls this morning at 7 a.m., so I've had an early start um, out supporting and encouraging um, everyone to get out to vote. So hopefully all of you in the audience did participate um, in the electoral process and, and cast your vote today at a poll. Polls are officially... Well, nope, we got eight minutes, so if you haven't, y'all can leave now <laughs> and try to get to your poll. Get in line, because if you show up at 7 um, and you're in line, you can still cast your vote. So Let's go. Original ballot. <laughs> All right. A um, couple of announcements that I have for District 4, which is the Donaldson Hermitage and uh, Old Hickory Community, the McGavick Cluster. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Kevin Armstrong, principal of DuPont Hadley Middle School, for inviting me to participate participate in Pencil's Principal for a Day. Um, it was really great to learn about um, our peace centers, um, and those would be our advocacy centers for middle schools um, that we have, um, and actually see students uh, being supported in action within those schools. Um, and so it was really get great to see um, our peace center in action and the student support that they received, um, and was able uh, the, the students were able to reset and return to class um, and have a successful day. So I was really excited about that. Um, I was also able to attend Ruby Major's art arts mentorship night um, and I'm really appreciative of all of our community partners who came out to expose and support students and families um, to the arts. Um, I was also excited to meet our very own MNPS and I believe he's at IT Cresswell um, School. His name is Aaron Haynes. Um, he starred at his AJ um, the nephew in the uh, Marvel movie The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. So we have a professional actor within the MNPS community at one of our MNPS schools. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and also I was um, really excited to learn about um, when we talk about preparing students for the next level, um, MacGyvick High School hosted an intent to graduate ceremony for current ninth graders um, to get them to start thinking now about their future um, into post-secondary opportunities opportunities, whether that's college or career. Um, it was a great ceremony for not only students, but their families, as well as community partners were able to participate um, and be, become mentors to ninth graders um, and follow them throughout their four-year tra trajectory. Um, so that is great when we talk about really supporting students and ensuring that they have the resources and tools and partnerships both within our system as well as community partners to support their success on that trajectory. Um, and then um, the Parent Advisory Council um, has their upcoming <coughs> district-wide uh, PAC meeting this Thursday from 5.30 to 7, um, right next door at the Wellness Center. If you are not a part of the Parent Advisory Council or the PAC, and you would like to uh, to join in and um, be a part of it, we are still recruiting parents. So if you are a MNPS parent, grandparent, legal guardian um, to a student here in our district, we, we 
we are really looking for parents to participate and get involved um, with the Parent Advisory Council. This is an opportunity to really lend your voice and create a true partnership between families um, and our district to, to ensure that we are on the, the trajectory for success for our children. Um, and then... Um, Lastly, I just want to um, thank our thank our board for thoughtful conversations that we've had today, um, just about how we are um, looking at looking at things that we do from an equity model and from an equity lens and ensuring that we are really working and thinking outside the box um, to to um, ensure student success um, across our district from our earliest uh, from, from from birth to three from elementary to middle school to high school and I I'm really excited about continuing these conversations thank you that meeting is Martin district Center. five Thank you, Chair, Chair Elrod. Um, I want to echo um, Dr. Nabama Kenny's words about the PAC, so reminding you all about the meeting on Thursday or Thursday evening. Um, thank you, Ms. Nancy Stedden and some of your sustainability friends for connecting with Jones Elementary School and working. Uh, I know in pre-K we've been talking about trees for maybe the past six weeks, and it's been fascinating to, to learn how the community is supporting that effort. So thank you, um, Nancy Stedden and your friends for making our, our garden even more beautiful at Jones and continuing to partner with Dr. Wilson there to make sure this is sustainable. I got the pun after I said it. Um, <laughs> also, uh, yes, my son attends Jones Elementary School. I will not define it by any other way but then by saying that it is a phenomenal school. And my son attended there as a three-year-old and has grown exponentially this second year of pre-K, which is why I will crawl on a bed of nails for Jones Elementary School, the same school that I attended. And I would like to think that I've done well in this life, but uh, a way that me, PTO mom and school board member, am trying to give back to my Jones that is doing so much for my son is by supporting via tutoring on Saturdays. So if you have free time on Saturdays, well, none of us have free time, right? But if you have some time that you are willing to donate, or, I'm sorry, this is not a donation, that you are willing to work with some of our students at Jones Elementary between 9.30 and 11.30, we have one and two hour slots. You can come and tutor a group of children in third, fourth, or fifth grade because those are our only tested grades but feel free to sign up if you'd like the link please email me at cbugs that's c-b-u-g-g-s at mnps.org and i will connect you with our phenomenal community achieves director who is helping to put all of this together because again the only way that we will make sure that all every every child is getting everything that they need is for the entire community to wrap their arms around them and make sure that um every child is experiencing resources from one zip code to the same similar if not equitable resources from one zip code to another uh and last Churchwell Elementary School that has recently rolled off of the list that shall not be named is having another installation of their museum night where they're getting Tennessee State artifacts to showcase in their museum. They're having these young people, these elementary school students, talk about history in a way that really allows them to live it because all of these artifacts are Nashville-based, North Nashville-based in their own community. So please feel free to, to join them on November 18th for, I believe this is the third installation. And uh, the first installation highlighted the Churchwell family. Mr. Churchwell, if you're not familiar was one of the first African-American um, uh, journalists, goodness, the word escaped me, journalist, and um, his blazer, I believe, his wingtip shoes, and maybe even a suit are hanging in the African-American uh, African Museum in uh, D.C. And so it's just a phenomenal experience if you want to understand why Robert Churchwell Elementary is a museum magnet school. Um, and I just, I, I continue to appreciate that we are having conversations in the community about our young people, and I just hope they will continue. Thank you. Thank you. District 6. Uh, no. Yes, correction. Um, with the PAC meeting, it is not in the Wellness Center. It is at the Martin Professional Development Center. So again, the upcoming PAC meeting is this Thursday from 5.30 to 7 at the Martin Professional Development Center. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, and I would just like to encourage uh, all of our families in Southeast Nashville, if you are not currently involved with the Parent Advisory Council, please do so. Uh, I got my start being voluntold as a parent uh, on the Parent Advisory Council and fell in love with it. And I'm not going to say you'll end up on the school board, but uh, wink, wink, there's an opportunity. <laughs> um, 
Just really quickly, uh, I want to give a big, big shout out to celebrity chef Mr. Sterling Wright, who took time out of his busy schedule to visit Antioch High School and talk with our culinary arts students about how they could get into the culinary arts game. He was amazing, and he motivated those young people in a way that I haven't seen them excited in a really long time. And he actually is coming back in a couple of weeks to cook. And I will be there because there's food. <laughs> so I'm really excited about that partnership that is developing uh, with Mr. Wright, and I'm very thankful for him. He has been instrumental in um, giving back his time in a lot of ways. I, I believe at Napier Elementary School, uh, he spends uh, time there with the young people there. So thank you, Mr. Wright, for your time. And also, uh, again, I will say thank you to um, Mrs. Myrie and her incredible team at the Cambridge Early Learning Center. I um, am doing a t-shirt wearing thing for all the schools in my district that I visit. I collect a t-shirt and I will wear them during school board meetings. So. The Cambridge Pandas, and Pandas is, is an acronym. It means Preparing and Nurturing Diverse Achievers. And I absolutely love that. So this is from Cambridge Early Learning Center. Next week, we'll see which T-shirt I'll be wearing. Um, the next community meeting for the District 6 community will be November 15th at the Southeast Branch Library in the large community room. The meeting will start promptly at 6.30. I would encourage you to come and chat with me if you have any questions, please. Uh, that's the time to, to have a conversation, so I encourage you to come to that meeting if you are available. And uh, lastly, Happy Veterans Day to all of our veterans out there. Veterans Day is this coming Friday, so happy Veterans Day in advance to all of our veterans, and thank you. That's all. District 7. Um, I don't have any official announcements, but I would like to make a comment. I know in the news, um, and it was referred to tonight, about um, the high school in my district, Glencliff. And I really challenge you to either talk to myself, or more importantly, Principal Wilson, and tour our school before you make judgments of what's going on. We are a very unique high school with very unique circumstances with our population that it's ununique to, unlike my other colleagues, um, with the students, particularly the immigrant population, um, and their background coming from their home country, the extenuating circumstances coming from their, whole their home country um, that we have to make up for. And then also due to state um, policies and restrictions really um, shed, a, shed a certain light that does not tell the full picture of the story. And so I really challenge you, if you never, if you have never met Principal uh, Wilson, <laughs> you need to meet him, because I've never met a fiercer advocate for these students. When I was at homecoming, myself and Mr. Carter um, was there, and we met a student. When he started the school year, he was six credits behind. Within less than two months, he made up those six recovery credits. And we literally practiced his graduation, and we challenged him that come May, that we're going to practice how to shake your hand, and Mr. Carter and I are literally going to be standing next to each other and expect to see him come May because now his credits are up to par, and he had a very unique thing. And so, and we spent literally half of the homecoming game talking about how are we advocating for Glencliff and how our students get the advocacy and the attention that they deserve and the resources they need. So um, make sure you know the full story because Nashville is a true diverse um, city. Uh, we have immigrants that have come through very difficult circumstances and that burden has not um, escaped our, our children. And so um, I just want to make sure I challenge you if you're going to participate in democracy, today's voting day and so democracy is not a spectator store, besides speaking, come and see and also come and help advocate and invest resources, particularly to Glencliff, because I have a special love and a special place in my heart just because these are children and students and young adults who are going through accentuated circumstances and overcoming them, just not in a traditional way. Um, and so come and join me and I challenge you to advocate um, for Glencliff High School and making sure the resources are put around. Um, and I also thank Dr. Battle. We have many, many discussions about it and her advocacy and also being part of the Glencliff family and her past history. We understand and we're fighting for um, children with very unique circumstances. So thank you. District 8. Um, 
so I want to take a, a quick minute to recognize the um, Blue Ribbon teachers that were named in District 8, um, Ashley Eggert, Harris Hillman, Leslie Hester at Sylvan Park, Kelly Larson at J.T. Moore, Henry Mahasi at Harris Hillman. Um, also to congratulate the J.T. Moore um, girls soccer team who won their fifth city championship in a row. Um, uh, and also Megs, um, who they played in that championship, and it was a fantastic game. Um, super proud of both teams. Um, and I, I, I want to say I, um, I was really moved by all of the public comment that we had tonight. Um, and you know, I, I think I've I've been in and around public education for a long time, and I've seen no harder work ever than the work of Priority Schools. And I want to compliment Dr. Perry and her team. Um, on the work they do every day to try and improve those schools. I don't think any of us would want to sit here and say that um, probably at any of our schools, but in particular at our schools that are struggling the most, that we feel like we're doing the best job we can every day for every kid. I think that's why we're here. It's the work that we're doing um, is to try and improve our schools overall so that our students have the best opportunity in their lives to achieve, and we're going to keep working at that. Um, and it's hard. And it's I don't think education is an either-or kind of game either. Um, it's not reading and math or outcomes outside of school, um, socio, you know, from a social emotional perspective or mental health. It's not, um, you know, it's not either celebrating reward schools or just prioritizing priority schools. It's not only accountability or not holding people accountable. It's it's not only choice or only zone schools. It's um, it's not, you know only doing pre-K and uh, and before school zero to five or doing K-12. It's all of these things if we're going to get our kids in this community to the place that they need to be in order to achieve their goals in life um, and to live um, a happy and productive life as adults. And, and so it's not an either or game. I think um, I get that. I would suspect my colleagues get that. Um, and I think we have to keep working um, to make sure that we're having these kinds of discussions. I mean, we do need to recognize both our successes. And I would compliment Dr. Battle and her team, since I've been on the board, bringing both things that we're struggling with um, and things we're doing well um, as part of the conversation. And I hope we can continue to dig in um, on all of those things, because this is not an either or game. These are not easy conversations. It's not easy work. It's hard work every day um, that our folks are doing in these schools. And so um, I'm looking forward to more conversations about how we continue to improve at all of our schools for all of our kids every day. District 9. Um, I also want to wish a um, happy Veterans Day to our veterans out there. We will not be having school on Friday in observance of that. Um, I also want to take a minute to let you know that Gower Elementary has hired a new Community Achievement Coordinator, Mrs. Kate Sinclair, and she would love to get to know more about the Gower families. And she's asked for families to fill out a short survey, and you can find a link to that survey on my social media pages. I also want to take a minute to thank the District 9 community for coming out in support of our new high school, James Lawson High School, last week. We were able to have a really big celebration um, to reveal our new high school colors and mascot, and it was really exciting. We got to hear from a Predators player, a Titan player, and a um, Nashville Soccer Club member, and it was just really it was great to see not just the whole larger community in the sense of the businesses and the groups, but also just the every, everyday um, people who are going to attend this school there and, and the community really stepping up and rallying around this new school. And I'm really, really excited about it, and I hope you guys are too. Um, our colors will be navy blue, Columbia sky blue, and sunny yellow to go along with our new mascot, the lightning. So let's go Lawson Lightning. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Junior board member. <laughs> okay, hi. Um, firstly, I want to congratulate all of the high school football teams who made it to the playoffs. So that's East Nashville, Cambridge, Pearl Cone, Maplewood, and Overton. Um, East, Cambridge, and Pearl all have advanced to the second round. So that's really exciting. Um, last Thursday, I got to 
participate in basketball media day. So that was also very fun. So winter sports are coming up and basketball, bowling, wrestling, all that. So go support um, our athletes. And then I just realized progress reports come out next week on the 15th. So be ready for that, kids. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Senior board member. Thank you. Uh, I just want to first congratulate Mr. Celebrate, who was a Blue Ribbon teacher and also my AP Guff t- teacher right now. And I hope this comment maybe gets me extra credit. But <laughs> <laughs> And I also want to bring up the fact that this month and the next month is going to be a very st- stressful time for seniors. It is college application season. And I know that November 1st was the deadline for early decision, early action for some schools. And I just want to highlight how sometimes it is the most the most stressful aspect of senior year is this little moment right here. And, and the worst part about it is that sometimes it doesn't feel like it ends. But in those moments, I think that's when seniors have to look at those around them and then draw strength from the people around you. Because I think the thing that I discovered is that the best thing about this struggle is that it's not just me struggling, but it's the 200 kids also in my class. And sometimes looking at their eyes and knowing that what I'm going through, they're also going through is very helpful to me. And, you know, when you're doing your essays, maybe invite your friends, go to a coffee shop together, work on it together, make sure to call each other up, you know, see where you are, check on each other, and and just hopefully we'll, you know, dig deep and and get out of this. Thank you. Thank you. Well, of course, I want to start off with talking about Overton, um, which is my high school. Um, So... Just this past weekend, the uh, Student Government Association, also their civics class, held their first family fall festival. It was really well attended, and I hope that more of the surrounding neighborhoods can attend it next year. It was a really wonderful reach out to the communities and, of course, to grow that cluster enthusiasm. It's been really fun to watch one of my sons particularly, like, fiercely defend Overton. Like, it's a little fierce. So um, it's been a fun change, and I have really looked forward to it. Also, I appreciate um, all the students that participated in last week's Mayor's Youth Summit. It was good to see our student board members and, of course, some of my colleagues. And I appreciate the candor and the information that was provided to us from a lot of those students and look forward to working with them going forward. Overton, of course, had a group there. Additionally, Overton um, is one of two of our 12 uh, high schools that had Blue Ribbon teachers, and we had four of them. So I want to uh, congratulate Deanna Kahn, Ellie Deenan, Cheryl Jolly, and Meredith McGinnis. Meredith, by the way, graduated from Clarksville High School, Clarksville's Pride, which I, too, graduated from. Oh, she was. Okay. Oh, my God. <laughs> and uh, then also at Oliver, we had Kristen Boone, Granberry, we had Marley Miller, and at Shane, we had Benjamin Slinkard, who is wonderful, and they do, um, I know she Benjamin, in case you don't know, does incredible uh, plays, and um, he's also an incredible gate teacher as well, so I don't want to ignore that. Um I want to say that I really appreciate all of my colleagues' time. I know that this is um, a difficult time, not only with our own family calendars, but of course also the holidays and our work schedules and everything else. So I really appreciate everybody being here tonight. We have several meetings still happening, even though it's, of course, election night, and we have upcoming meetings through November and December as well. I encourage our uh, public to still come to those, and I look forward to y'all joining us and pushing the ball forward is kind of what I like to say and helping join us in pushing that ball. There are so many parts to this job. We have many pieces to our strategic vision, and it takes all of us. Um, The theme that we've heard is, of course, that it takes a community and it takes a village, and that is so very true. So we cannot do it without you, and we appreciate y'all being here. And uh, other than that, I hope that you participated in democracy and that you voted. The polls are now closed, and so is this meeting. Thank you. has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov. 